what is your name? Uh, Stephen Dick. Okay, and what do you do? Well, I'm retired right now, but I was the NASA chief historian, and before that I was at the Naval Observatory for 24 years doing astronomy and history, and I've also been at the Library of Congress and at the Air and Space Museum, so everything's related to astronomy. <laughs> okay, and so are we alone in the universe? Well, it depends on your metaphysical preconceptions. <laughs> okay. oh, what, what do you mean by metaphysical preconceptions? Well, uh, you know, uh, everybody, including scientists, have uh, presuppositions, let us call them. And uh, my presupposition in the case of uh, life in the universe is that uh, we are nothing special. Our planet is nothing special in the universe. And uh, that's called the Copernican presupposition. And the Darwinian presupposition is that wherever life can evolve, it will evolve. Uh, so, you know, we can't assume what we want to prove, but those are, I always state, my preconceptions. And uh, every working scientist has uh, uh, preconceptions or working hypotheses, and that's my working hypothesis. And the trick then is to go out and, uh, and uh, uh, try and, and prove whether that's true or not. And when I asked you the question, are we alone, uh, what did you understand by the word we? We, I would understand everybody on Earth, the planet Earth. Everybody, all life forms or all humans? All humans. All humans. But it's, isn't it the case that if you ask the question, are we alone, we humans alone, we're not, the answer is no because we're not alone on Earth. Well, that's cer certainly true, right. And, uh, you know, you can get into what we mean by intelligence also, uh, you know, uh, by... Some definitions, so there are lots of intelligent things on the Earth, including octopuses and, and dolphins, and, and so we shouldn't be too chauvinistic about being intelligent, although we do a lot of neat things that others don't, but they do things that we don't. <laughs> right. Um, is this question an important question? Are we alone? Oh, I think it's one of the greatest questions, uh, unresolved questions in science, and uh, it's been you know talked about for millennia now, since the ancient Greeks, and uh, I think it's because it's such a compelling question and we haven't had the techniques to, uh, to really resolve it until, you know, the last few decades. Uh, and that's why you've had, you have all kinds of strange kinds of arguments, analogy and all, all kinds of things uh, which were not able to resolve the problem or came up with the wrong answers. Uh, but I think now for the first time we can uh, start to, uh, to answer this. Now the ancient Greeks wrote things down, but presumably people were asking some kind of questions that might resemble the question, are we alone, even earlier, like 10,000 years ago or 20,000 years ago, people would look up in the sky and maybe think of, I don't know, spirits from... Uh, the... Right, right. Yeah, I mean, uh, I always distinguish the natural from the supernatural. Uh, you know, 10,000 years ago, they were more likely thinking of, uh, I don't know, gods or spirits in the sky. And uh, as, a, as a scientific enterprise, uh, defining science very broadly, I would say that the modern debate began with the ancient Greeks. And why is it the modern debate? Well, um, because that's the first time... Well, let me tell a little story. Uh, my interest in this whole subject goes back to uh, graduate school when uh, I was looking for a dissertation topic and decided to uh, do it on the history of the extraterrestrial life debate. And this was a history of science department. And they said, well, there's, there are two problems with that. It's not science and it has no history worth looking at. <laughs> <laughs> so I actually had to change advisors. I always, the lesson for graduate students is never listen to, because they didn't want me to do it. Oh. Uh, so the lesson is don't always listen to your <laughs> graduate advisor. Uh, if you think you have a good idea, stick to it. Uh, and I did, um, and I did the subject, although I wanted to do the whole history from the ancient Greeks to the present, but after four years, I was only up to the mid-18th century, uh -huh. <laughs> which turned out to be a good place to stop because other people took, took over from there. But anyway, uh, you could start with the ancient Greeks in a scientific, broadly scientific sense because, um, for example, you had cosmological traditions like the ancient atomists, Leucippus and Democritus, Epicurus, Lucretius, um, who believed that there were an infinite number of worlds, some of them inhabited. And they believed that based on their cosmological worldview. And before that, you don't think there was a cosmological worldview? Or we, maybe they did and we don't know about we it? Don't, we probably don't know about it. There, there certainly were some kind of worldviews, but it's not written down, so we can't say. But you, you're making a distinction between superstition and natural, and you think the Greeks had a natural... Yes. 
So how was that transition from superstition to a natural question, or a more scientific question? Well, uh, the ancient Greeks had this uh, idea of, uh, that all things were made from atoms. Yeah. Uh, of course, they didn't know what, <laughs> it's not our modern conception of atoms, but they used that to uh, come to a number of conclusions, including that there were an infinite number of worlds. In other words, the, the atoms were infinite in nature, and not all of them were used up in our finite world, so there must be other worlds. So they weren't asking, is Zeus, uh, the presence of Zeus on another planet? No, Zeus was on Mount Olympus, presumably, no, and that was associated with the mythology and the superstition. That's right. And But they were, besides that, they were ask, able to ask a secular question, you're saying? That's right, exactly. Uh-huh. Yeah. And uh, what do you think, were there answers all over the place? And well, did... that was, uh, so that's one cosmological tradition, the ancient atomist tradition, and then came along Aristotle. And Aristotle believed, based on his physics, that there was only one world. Now, world is being defined not as a planet here, but as a cosmos. Uh -huh. um, so, so what we would say universe then. But basically, it's a, yeah. But a small universe. Well, yeah, <laughs> not, not an infinite universe, uh, a finite universe. So uh, Aristotle had this physics, uh, based on the physics of motion, um, uh, things had to move towards the center of the earth. And his argument was that if you had more than one center, then things would be confused. And, mm -hmm. and he went through a whole series of arguments uh, and concluded based on his physics at the time mm -hmm. uh, that there could be only one cosmos. And so then this was picked up during the Middle Ages. You know, there were all the commentaries on, on Aristotle, on his book De Kylo, On the Heavens. And so there's a long tradition in the Middle Ages uh, about uh, whether or not there could be another world. And that ran headlong into Christianity, you know, the omnipotence of God. If God was omnipotent, couldn't uh, he create another world? Mm. And, and how would that work if that was against physics of well, the time? Well, before we get too much into that, what about yeah. other cultures? What about Japan or Australian Aborigines or the Chinese or, yeah. you know, Aztecs? Or... You know, that's a great question. And I think... Um, uh, either it's my own limitations or there's something going on about Western culture, which is, is sort of obsessed by this idea, mm -hmm. as we are even in the 20th century, uh, 21st century. Uh, uh, there, there are some indications that there's some interest to this in other cultures, but not nearly the uh, continuous tradition that we see in, the West, in Western culture. And why that should be, if that's true, is, is a, a great research project, I think. Oh. Well, well, maybe it's from... Uh... In the West, we have an early division, but what you called the superstition and the natural question, and that mm -hmm. division is, I think, is somewhat unnatural for human cultures. Because mm -hmm. when I've talked to people about this, and they, oh yeah, there's God, there, there are aliens in the sky, but they're more along the superstitious and ah. this God and that God doing this, like mm -hmm. constellations. Yeah, yeah, you'd really need somebody with, uh, you know, facility in different languages, uh, uh, you know, Oriental languages. Eastern languages to uh, really do some research on this, and uh, I think there may be people coming coming along who, who may do that. Okay, how about uh, when the Greeks were asking these questions, were they asking about life elsewhere, or were they asking about intelligent life elsewhere? That were... Almost entirely intelligent. Uh, the, most of the debate up to, almost up to the 20th century is about intelligence, uh, because they didn't, well, of course they didn't, know about microbes, for example, until, right. until the late 17th century. They knew about the, the uh, complex Plant. life, yeah. you know, whales and things like that, dolphins. But they, you know, the, 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 the mainstream question was about whether there was other intelligence out there, whether like us or not like us, that sort of thing. So they weren't asking about trees and chlorophyll or no. plants or no. fungi? No, they and... just weren't that... How about reptiles? Were they asking about reptiles or were they asking about mammals elsewhere? No. Uh, you know, it comes to mind uh, uh, A.R. Wallace, who was the co-founder with Darwin of Natural Selection. And he wrote a book in 1905, I think it was, uh, Man's Place in the Universe. Mm -hmm. uh, and he was a biologist um, and, of course, a naturalist. And he started to go into more detail about what, what do we mean when we talk about life and could there be that kind of life uh, elsewhere. Mm -hmm. So that was early in the 20th century, and, and he came to the conclusion, based on his presuppositions, his metaphysical assumptions, that the uh, solar system was basically at the center of the universe and there was no life because the conditions here were the, what you needed. Sort of a, uh, an echo of what we later got in um, uh, Ward and Brownlee's book uh, on rare earth. They made a similar, you know, everything has to be just right, and so yeah, maybe we are the only life. 
You talked about the Greeks asking a secular question, right? And then, then we go into I guess Christian West, right? Where I guess it was the church that was mostly leading. I guess the church that was guiding the philosophers at that time. There were no philosophers independent of the church in the Middle Ages, were there? Well, you had the rise of the universities beginning in the eleventh, twelfth, thirteenth centuries. Paris University, Oxford University, and you had the scholars there. Uh, who were debating these points. Okay. And, this, like Abelard was asking, are we alone in the universe? I'm not sure of Abelard in particular, but William of Ockham, Thomas Aquinas, John Buridan, a whole list, chapter two of my book, uh -huh. my first book. <laughs> so what, how did they phrase this question? Today we say, are we alone? What were they asking? They must... Is there a plurality of worlds? And that meant? Uh, uh, plurais mundi in the Latin. That meant a plurality of cosmoi, which is, uh, uh, cosmos is, you know, everything with the Earth at the center, of course, the Aristotelian system uh, was a, a geocentric system. So you got the Earth at the center, uh, the spheres of the planets, and then finally the sphere of the, of the fixed stars. So that was a cosmos. So and that whole thing. Uh, so the question was: Was there a plurality of those cosmoi? So they thought that beyond this sphere of the sky, there were other spheres. Possibly. Well, possibly. Well, that that's was... the question they were asking. Oh, so they weren't asking about. Planets around another star. They didn't. Didn't they know that the sun was a star? That not not really. I mean, you had some uh, inklings in the, you know in ancient even in ancient Greece, but it was really Giordano Bruno in the, you know the the 16th century, who started this uh, uh, this idea, this question about the sun. Uh, the stars are just suns like our own. So the plurality of worlds predates Giordano Bruno. Oh yes. Who is that like a that Greek would, thing? Or? Well, that would be in Greek it was called the Peroi Cosmoi. They were still using, I think, using the word cosmos already there, uh, and plurais mundi in the Latin tradition. But uh, you had these medieval uh, scholars like William of Ockham and Thomas Aquinas, all of whom, of course, were steeped in the Christian tradition, asking these questions um, uh, to the point where finally in 1277 there was something called the Condemnation of 1277, uh, which included uh, where the the Catholic Church condemned a bunch of propositions, including that there could be a plurality of worlds. And by, let's be more specific here. Right. The plurality of worlds meant then we see the Earth, we see other planets, we see our star, and we see this well other stars, and that's a world. That's right. They're not asking if there's life on Mars in particular or, right. or Jupiter or anything else right. at this point. They're asking us. There, that's like more like a multiverse. Then is well, there another? That's a that's a it's a precursor sort of. Yeah, it's. So is there another, are there other universes? Right. Plur so that's, plurality of world meant, the, is there a plurality of universes? That's right. And did life forms come in those, did they imagine, when they asked that question, did they imagine that there was life, in a uh, human life in those other worlds? Well, some, sort, some did, some didn't, but the, uh, the, the point was, when you come head on with Christianity, uh, you know, what are, the, what are the implications for th Christian theology if that's true? Mm. That question was asked already in the 15th century, and sporadically thereafter, and, and even today. I mean, there are books now written on this, and conferences. Uh, well, so. well, so I have interviewed a couple of religious people, and, right. and there's a wide range of, you know, why are you asking me? You're the scientist. <laughs> to, oh, no, it wouldn't be a problem if uh, God had created uh, other human beings. It would just, so, and other person say, oh, no, there are no aliens because it, they're not in the Bible. So really quite a range. What range of, of, of beliefs have you encountered from a more religious perspective, people with a religious perspective of varying religions? Yeah, there's, there's no consensus. Uh, we, we've had meetings on this sponsored by the Templeton Foundation, for example. Um, and, uh, well, um, for example, the Vatican Observatory is a, is a good case. So George Coyne used to be the director of the Vatican Observatory. Uh, he was very skeptical that we could... He thought it was sort of a cop-out uh, because most people say, well, some way uh, the Christian religion will get around this. They'll change the doctrine, expand the doctrines of, uh, doctrines of incarnation and redemption uh, and, and uh, you know, expand their theologies in that way. He thought that was kind of a cop-out because, uh, you know, a uh, one-to-one -one relationship between God and humans is sort of central to Christianity. Mm -hmm. um, and, what and about so, Judaism or Islam or Buddhism or Shintoism? Yes, or... well, the, the, the Eastern religions are, don't have that same kind of thing. So I think there that it would be uh, you know, not such a, such a problem. Um, and, uh, what would not be such a problem? If there were life elsewhere? Were, were there elsewhere. humanoid life or were Jesus Christ elsewhere? If there were humans 
uh, humanoid kind of life or intelligent life elsewhere would not be such a problem mm -hmm. for the Eastern religions, I think, and other people have, have said the same thing. Uh, now, on the, on the other hand, uh, uh, now you have uh, Guy Consul Magno, who's the director of the Vatican Observatory. Uh, he uh, wrote a book which is titled, Would You Baptize an Extraterrestrial? Mm -hmm. And uh, his answer was, uh, only if it asked. Uh, which I thought was a, is an improvement over the 16th century when they, <laughs> with the whole analogy with the, the uh, old world meeting the new world. Um, so, um, so he's assuming that asking is a universal, you're able to well, ask. Well, that's right, that's right, yes, yes. Uh, so That's a metaphysical uh, assumption. Of course. What do you think of that? Well, uh, that's, that's a very large question. I mean, there are all kinds of metaphysical assumptions here, and uh, we can talk more about that. Uh, uh, I'm not sure if you want to get off on that angle right now, but we have to try and think outside of our heads. And, uh, you know, when we, when we talk about life, when we talk about intelligence, when you talk about culture or civilization or technology or communication, we have to try and think outside of our heads. Uh, and these have real world uh, implications when you're talking about a, a SETI search, a search for extraterrestrial intelligence or something. You know, what do you mean by intelligence? Or when the Vikings went to Mars, what do you mean by life? They had to adopt an operational definition. So you have to think outside of, outside of what you usually think about, which is, I think, one of the great things about astrobiology. It makes you think outside of, of the usual mainstream thought. Well, when you study the history of around this question, are we alone, what are the mind-blowing things? Like, oh, I would have never thought that they would have thought that, but that's what the, apparently they thought. So how... You know, when, when the, we go around today and ask a bunch of people about are we alone, you get a bunch of opinions, but presumably those opinions are somewhat, maybe even very, very different from you did the same thing a thousand years ago or maybe 500 years earlier than that, etc. We talked about the transition from superstition to natural, but they're also within that natural, there's a large framework of very weird things you can assume. Right. Well, you have to think about that in terms of the, the current uh, natural philosophy, as they called it in the times, or the current cosmology. I mean, a, a good example is what we were just talking about. The uh, you know the geocent in the geocentric universe, uh, you were constrained uh, by their idea of what the universe was like, what the cosmos was like, but they were also constrained by their religious beliefs. Uh, you know that uh, uh, God could create other worlds, but you're you're Natural philosophy at the time says that that wouldn't work. So how does that, <laughs> how does that but work? I'm, but I'm confused about this other worlds and plurality of worlds. Right. That doesn't necessarily imply that you're asking, you're not necessarily asking the question, are we alone? You're saying, is there another world? Or do you necessarily assume that there's life and humans in those other worlds? Well, some of them did assume it and others didn't. Uh, as I say, already in the 15th century, people were asking the question, if there was intelligence on other on on these other worlds uh, on these other cosmos yeah, yeah. cosmoses, uh, how would that affect our theology? Would they have been saved? Uh -huh. You know, the doctrine of incarnation and redemption and that sort of thing. So it has to be seen both in the context of the natural philosophy of the time and the other worldviews of the time, including religious worldviews. So if they were people were asking this, I mean, Giordano got burned at the stake famously. I guess yes, February of 1600. Yeah, <laughs> burned so. At the stake. Presumably, this was this a dangerous question to ask at all times, or ju just for a couple of hundred years, or something? Or well, um, okay. So in the in the Middle Ages, they were they would be these commentaries on Aristotle, beginning already in like the 12th century, maybe even the 11th century, and these were more or less scholarly debates about whether there could be other worlds or not. And and based on the natural philosophy, they would say no, and then somebody would ra later would raise the question, well, what if God wanted to? And they would say, okay, well, if God wanted to, they, they could. Uh, well, that sounds like a rather heretical debate that I, if I were Pope, I would kill them. Well, it depended on the Pope, and it depended on the circumstances <laughs> at the time. I mean, Nicholas of Cusa, yeah. uh, you know, in the 15th century, I guess that was, uh, was a cardinal, and wrote in his of book of learned ignorance that he thought there could be life on other worlds and that sort of thing. He didn't get into trouble at all. But 100 years later, uh -huh. 150 years later, Bruno got burned at the stake. Uh, the <laughs> life on other worlds, did he mean humanoid life or did he mean plants or what? And other specified. worlds, did he mean other cosmoi, like you said? He or... was still saying other cosmoi. It was Bruno with Bruno that things started to get changed. 
Well, really with Copernicus, and, and this gets back to what I originally said about worldviews and cosmologies. Uh, you had the ancient atomist cosmology, you had the, um, the Aristotelian cosmology, which we, we just talked about, the geocentric cosmology, and then you had the Copernican cosmology switch that totally to heliocentric. So the, and with that, the Earth became a planet, and the planets became potential Earths. And did the sun become a star? The sun, uh, Copernicus himself would not say that, but that's what Bruno said. And that's, Bruno said the sun. That's one of the things that got him into trouble. But he said, <laughs> when he said that, he right. also said, hey, there are planetary systems around those stars, right? That's right. So he's not thinking of a plurality of world anymore. He's thinking of... That's the transition in the, in the uh, late 16th century and, uh, and certainly by the 17th century when you get another cosmological tradition, which is the Cartesian tradition, uh, which had this idea of uh, whirling vortices. And, uh, and you can see there are pictures of, you know, great uh, illustrations of woodcuts of this mm -hmm. where you have many um, worlds going around each sun. So they were right. So by that time, by that time, it's uh, the world has transitioned from the idea of the world, the, con the uh, concept of world has transitioned from a cosmos to a planet. That seems to be the transition to knowing that the sun is a star then. That's right. Yeah. With Bruno, beginning in Bruno, late, you know, you can never quite pinpoint this, but beginning in late uh, 16th century, early 17th century, um, you know, people wrote books like uh, uh, Discovery of a World in the Moon. They thought the moon might be a world. And that, that was another thing with Galileo's observations in 1610. Beginning, you know, you could see the craters on the moon and the mountains on the moon. So there's another possible world. Um, and did you think Galileo thought that there were inhabitants of the moon? Well, <laughs> he said it was possible, but they would be beyond all our imaginings. And of course, there you really get into trouble. Uh, he said beyond our imaginings. Beyond our imaginings, right? Which is it's like Gaylord, not bad, but George actually. Gaylord Simpson or Haldane said it's not only strange, weird. It's, it's not <laughs> only hard to. What did he say? Beyond. What was this? Haldane said. He said something. Not only. Let's see. Yeah, queer than we can, can believe. Not only not queer than we believe, or queer, queer, than, queer we can, than we can right. believe. So that's like more. That. So you think that's a pretty accurate description of what Galileo thought of the moon, the lunar inhabitants? That's right. And Kepler, on the other hand, who uh, you know had Galileo's observations, he was uh, he definitely thought there were inhabitants on the moon because he saw he he thought that some of the perfectly circular craters might be artificially artificial constructions. But his book about the moon inhabitants was kind of, I thought it was like a science fiction. He knew oh. it wasn't necessarily true. He was just making up a good story. Well, that's the somnium, the dream. Yes. Yes. And that's that's true. And that, there's a lot of that in there. Yeah. But he also made that point in other of his works, which are not fictional. So. Oh, so he, yeah. did he entertain the idea or did he kind of think that that was the way it was? He, I'd say he espoused the idea. Uh, Galileo's um, Sidereus Nuncius, Sidereal Messenger, was 1610. I think it was 1611, the following year, that Kepler uh, wrote a conversation with Galileo Sidereal Messenger where he raised this. Uh, he knew about Bruno and he raised the possibility that there was life on the moon and elsewhere. Uh -huh. yeah. Now, I read also that Herschel thought there might be life in the sun. <laughs> That's right. How does that work? <laughs> well, uh, you should be asking Michael Crow about that. Uh, when I finished at the mid, mid 18th century, um, uh, Michael Crow, who is a professor at University of Notre Dame, um, historian of science, was beginning where I left off and uh, went from uh, 1750 to 1900. And William Herschel was one of his main people, although the, he has hundreds and hundreds of people looking at how they believed the idea of extraterrestrial life based on their philosophies and their science and that sort of thing. Um, so, but, but, uh, well, but Herschel, yeah, Herschel didn't know what the sun was, you know, uh, at, at that point. Nobody knew what it was. Even if they thought the stars might be like the sun, uh -huh. uh, they didn't know what the temperatures of the sun were. Right, yet, so, right. Or they thought there might be cooler regions on the sun. Now, there's a story in, in ancient uh, China about people who said, oh, how big is the emperor's nose? And no one knows, but they say, oh, maybe it's this long, maybe it's this long. And then they take it, and then they average it, and then that becomes the, the I don't <laughs> know, some kind of semi-scientific version of how big the emperor's nose is. Now, when you're collecting and, and assessing ideas from history of what people thought about extraterrestrials, right. is it any different from th than that? Well, yeah. I mean, as I say, when I started in this, people said it wasn't science and it had no history. And what I showed was that 
well, it may not be science in what we think of as now uh, as science, but it certainly had a history. And not only did they have a history, it, it wasn't crazy people who were talking about this. It was people who were doing what they thought of as science at the time, natural philosophy, and the idea of life in other worlds was connected to those cosmological worldviews. How is that different from people's vision of what uh, God or gods are like as a function of time? The alien, we don't have any aliens. We don't know what they are. Right. They might not exist. They might, and kind of gods are kind of like the same thing. And so people have, through time have different visions of what right. God or gods are. So how is that different? Oh, so that sort of goes to the question that you sometimes hear or the comment that, like SETI, the search for extraterrestrial intelligence is just an, uh, another form of religion. Mm -hmm. My answer to that is that it's uh, totally different because religion is supernatural. And, and what we're looking for is natural. I mean, you can't get much different than that. <laughs> well, they're looking for something natural. Well, a lot of people who believe really in God, they think that's natural, right? They, well, they're not, not making the, much of a people all who are, the, All uh, the mainstream religions are supernatural, as far as I know. Well, I don't know. Certainly, if God, the God of Christianity, yeah. is a supernatural being. Not, well, I think not, scientists describe him that way. But if you're a really profound Christian believer, you think, "Oh, that's God is natural." I would have thought. Well, if God was, if God was natural, then you could find him in the clouds. Right? <laughs> well, a lot of people then, thought that you'd go to heaven. There, it's right over there. Where did God come from then? It's, it would have to be evolution by natural selection ending in God. Now, if you want to call that God, I'm okay with that because <laughs> because that's but, a natural thing. But isn't it the case that when I talk to SETI people, right. I get the feeling that they are somehow looking for God in a natural way. They're looking for aliens who are, they want to find aliens who are omniscient mm -hmm. and know all everything and really, really advanced and right. therefore can solve our problems, etc. Right. So that's a big motivation of SETI researchers. So that seems like a search for God to me. I don't think it's a big motivation. I mean, you no. hear that, but I don't think it is. I think they're genuinely interested in the question, of, are we the only life on the earth or not? Uh, and then well, you go... Well, well, you no, do... no, no, they're not looking for They're looking for the only technological species. Well, tech, okay. it has to be, they're not looking for life. They're looking for technological life, and that means like Well, the human. study people are. Yes, yes, yes. There's a whole discipline of astrobiology. Yes. They're not looking for... Yes. Uh, Yes. In fact, that's right. That's the, US government, right. the U.S. government won't allow any money to be spent on the search for extraterrestrial intelligence. That's another is interesting... That right? yeah. Oh, why is that? Since 1993. Yes, yes. Well, uh, there's a whole history of that, but uh, it, it came down to the Congress voting in the darkness of the night to uh, uh, the same year that they did away with the superconducting super collider, that uh, it was a waste of government funds to look for little green men. Mm -hmm. it, was a, a, it was a It was a senator who was looking mm -hmm. for votes and saying, we're spending $12 million on this and couldn't we use that for something better, mm -hmm. you know, and ha-ha. And... <laughs> where, where did the idea of little green men come from? Why not little blue men or big blue yeah, men? Yeah, or... that, that's a good question. Little green men. I'm not sure what the origin of the green okay. part is, right. Yeah, but it is <laughs> something that you hear about. I, I know uh, back, uh, you know, in the days when they were discovering pulsars, there was the, yes, uh, you know, that, that was LGMs, little yes, green yes, men already yes. then. But I don't know how far back that goes. Yeah. Maybe science fiction when... You know, you had aliens and, and these uh, this artwork on the covers, and they drew them as green. But why, I don't know. <laughs> okay. Now, a lot of people who are looking for aliens now, or you see them on TV or Hollywood, they have big brains. Right. And I guess that that seems to me to say, okay, how do we self-identify? Oh, well, we're special because we have big brains. Therefore, we're going to make the aliens even more special, and that's who we're looking for. That's who we want to find. Is that correct, you think? No, I think we have to think out of the box again. Um, I mean, there's some reason to think they would be more advanced because, you know, intelligence on Earth, is, depending on how you define intelligence, is not, uh, you know, let's say human intelligence is in the, in the history of the Earth, four and a half billion years is a relatively recent thing. Uh, but the universe, of course, is 13.8 billion years old, and you could have had rocky planets, you know, within a few hundred million years, and it would have, even if you say it takes four billion years, uh, more than four billion years to develop intelligence as it did on Earth. You know, if you had uh, life begin to evolve, uh, you know, say 10 billion years ago, they got a few billion year head start, maybe they would be more advanced. But that's a progressive kind of argument, which is not necessarily true. So the people who are looking for the answers to our problems, mm -hmm. uh, that's a naive assumption, I would say. Now, you said the progressive argument that's not necessarily true. Can you talk a little bit about that? Because the, the great chain of being, the, uh, the evolutionary ladder is a very strong... Uh, 
image in popular culture and among most scientists, mm -hmm. I think. And Stephen Jay Gould has written about trying to undermine that. Right. But you'll still see these T-shirts with, you know, the little thing, right. the bigger thing than us. So tell me a little bit about the history of that. And is there any uh, way to provide an antidote? for it? How true is that and how untrue is that? Well, the Western world takes for granted the idea of progress. I mean, there are books written on this idea of progress. Only the Western world? Well, maybe the other, you know, it's, this is my own limitation again. Maybe yeah. it, maybe uh, uh, others too. I, uh, certainly the Western world. Okay. The idea of progress and the idea of increasing complexity uh, and that we, <clears throat> you know, uh, I mean, manifestly, things have gotten more complicated from microbes to intelligence. But that doesn't mean over the long term that uh, it has to stay that way. Um, well, I tell my students just the opposite. I say that microbes have chemical complexity and we have morphological complexity. Mm -hmm. And who's to say what complexity is uh, better or uh, directional? Or I guess I, I kind of try to undermine the idea that there's a direction to evolution. And you, what do you think? Yeah, I'd say the same thing. I don't think that's the opposite of what I said. Mm -hmm. uh, um, there seems to be more complexity, but... Um, you said there were microbes and then there were intelligence as if... As if right. But that doesn't mean that always happens on other worlds either. Uh, that doesn't mean that's the way it has to happen. Uh, it's happened that way on the earth, and we're not sure that they'll continue to happen that way. I mean, <coughs> this is, um, I sometimes have made the argument that we may live in a, in a post-biological universe mm -hmm. uh, where, uh, you know, the intelligence is mostly artificial intelligence. Mm. And that's kind of a projection of where we may be going. People like Kurzweil and Moravec say that it might happen here in a few generations if you're optimistic or pessimistic, whichever way well, you want to look at it. <laughs> well, well, if you think that, and some people do that, like Martin yeah. Rees thinks that, yes, for example. Yes, he does. He, yeah. Now, should that mean we should not be looking on planets for life, but we should be looking for inorganic life between the planets, looking for other civilization right. satellites rather than organic scum? Well, this is one of the things that we raised at the SETI Institute just last month when we're talking about what do we mean by intelligence? Um, and it could be post-biological intelligence, artificial intelligence. And the question then is, how does that affect your study search, your search for intelligence then? They don't have to be on a planet around a sun-like star. They could be in between. But how, does the, how, how is the techno-signature for artificial intelligence different from the biosignature or the techno-signature from biological intelligence? That's a question that's not been asked very much and certainly not been implemented in study searches. In 1995, <coughs> Ernst Mayer and Carl Sagan had a debate yes. uh, on, on back and forth a couple of times in right. a magazine. Uh, you're aware of that debate. Yep. What, do you, what do you think of that? Well, Meyer, as I recall, Ernst Mayer said that there was only, intelligence that only evolved once on Earth. Mm -hmm. That's a very narrow view of intelligence. Uh, even if you... Well, I think he was using Carl Sagan's. And that is the ability to build a telescope, the right. operational definition used by SETI. Right. And that's the one he was talking about. Okay. And he was but, well aware of all the other types of brains and how they Yeah, being a, being a biologist himself. Yeah, right? it is. Yeah, but it's a, narrow, it's a narrow view of intelligence, even so, technological intelligence. Uh, and, and, you know, intelligence out there, even if it's technological, may not use radio telescopes. Uh, there may be other, other ways of, of doing it. So... Well, I'm a little bit on the, the Meyer side of this. I think that he would say, sure, if you're going to... Everything has a, some kind of intelligence. Right. That's what, the, that's what an animal is. <laughs> that's that's right. usually associated with animals. Yeah. How about non-metazoan <coughs> non intelligence? Uh, what, has anybody talked about that? Plants and fungi and uh, single-celled eukaryotes? Well, when you, turn, when you talk about... I mean, in the broader astrobiology community, you could talk about biosignatures. Uh, and, and that could go anywhere from, you know, plants producing oxygen to techno signatures with intelligence. So there's that whole, uh, that whole uh, spectrum of, of possible intelligence. It's true that it's hard to imagine how you might detect it. And that's, of course, what Drake and all the others were doing uh, with the Drake equation and, and the, the SETI search is, is using the tools they had at the time. Uh, but still, that's a narrow view of intelligence, and I don't think enough has been thought about how we might detect other forms of intelligence. You know the Planet of the Apes movies. Right. And, uh, and the idea is that humans marginalize themselves, or if we make ourselves go extinct, that the other apes will evolve into what the intelligence niche that we have uh, abandoned. Do you think there is such an intelligence niche? Uh, 
By intelligence niche, you mean what exactly, though? I guess whatever it, the niche that we think we occupy to make the cameras and telescopes and microscopes. And well, I would think of it as a whole landscape of intelligence possibilities. Um, but the practical question, again, is always how, from here, how do you detect that? That's what the SETI people were worrying about. Well, let's just talk about on Earth. If right. we kill ourselves in World War Three or Four or Five, right? Uh, do you think how long will we have to wait before someone, uh, another species, invents a camera? Oh, I don't think that's uh, predetermined at all. Um, I didn't ask you if it was predetermined. I asked you how long do you think it would take. You think it might take forever? It might take. Uh... I have no idea. <laughs> <laughs> So the reason I'm asking is because yeah. a lot of people have some ideas about this. Some right. biologists, for example, Simon Conway Morris, he, right. talk, he thinks that human-like intelligence is a convergent feature of evolution. We should right, even right. expect humanoids on other planets. Right. And uh, other people like Stephen Jay Gould think, wait a minute, no, biology goes all the heck, all over the place. Right. And if we rewound the tape of life, right, or right. Like the Cambrian, or even just 100 million years ago, we wouldn't... Like we Stephen wouldn't, Jay Gould. Yeah. Yes, right. we wouldn't expect... Right anything like humans to come again, and that presumably means anything technological to come again. Right, so the question is whether intelligence is a convergent characteristic. Yes. And human I just like don't know. Intelligence. Sorry? Human, -like human intelligence. Human intelligence is a convergent. I don't, I don't know. I'm, uh, that's not my expertise, so I just don't have an opinion on that. Okay. But the only way to uh, find out is to, is to, to look that, uh, to look for intelligence, and the question is exactly how to do that with radio telescopes or whatever and what frequencies and that sort of thing, which is the whole, the whole study endeavor. How about the question of what is life? Because uh, Jack Sostak wrote an article in 2012 about a uh, defining life does not help us understand the origin of life. Right. Uh, what do you think of that? Yeah, I agree with that. Uh, I mean, there are philosophers like Carol Cleland who have written that we really it's really a waste of time to try and define life, unless, it, unless you have to have an operational definition, as we did when we went to Mars with the Viking you have to do certain experiments, so you have to have an operational definition. Carol Cleveland's uh, uh, point of view, and I think Chris um, Chris McKay's, was it Chris McKay or Chris Chiba? Chris Chiba, Chris Chiba. Chiba yeah. Mm -hmm. Was also that, uh, you know, that you, unless you have a systems view of biology, uh, you can't define life. The only, the only life we know about is life on Earth, and it's all originated with, from the same place. So until you, that's one of the great things about astrobiology, because, if, you know, if you find another independent genesis, as they always say, then maybe you can start to get a more general uh, theory of biology or uh, biological systems. You know. I've asked a lot of people uh, this question, are we alone? And the word alone, it became apparent that some people thought that if we find life on Mars, microbes on Mars, then we would no longer be alone. Other people thought, no, we need to find intelligent life with whom we can communicate before we would consider ourselves not alone. Now, has the concept of alone changed over time? Well, I think most people would consider the latter when you're asking that question. The beings that we can communicate with in some way and identify with in some way. On the other hand, uh, the, um, you know, if you find microbes, a lot of people say, well, if you find microbes, so it's just, you know, step by step, you eventually get, that's, that's an indication that, you know, certainly one of the big jumps is going from non-life to life. So if you've got life elsewhere, maybe you can make that next jump, which is possibly even a bigger jump to go to intelligence such as, such as we have. Um, so it's not a guarantee, but a lot of people, I think, make that jump that if you have microbes, you might have intelligence. Mm -hmm. Well, how about the origin of life? I mean, let's talk about that. What has, I mean, now we're, a lot of people working on the origin of life. Right. That probably was not something that the ancients talked about much? Oh, no, even Darwin, you know, has the famous <clears throat> famous quote uh, near the end of his book that maybe a life originated in some warm little pond, and that's about all he knew about it. Uh, so certainly, origins of life question didn't come in, into uh, the mainstream until the 20th century with uh, Oparin and Haldane in the 1920s. And Bruno and Occam and Nicholas de Cusa, they didn't talk about the origin of life? They Not that I know of, no. Did they think it was just a natural thing if they had another world that they were talking about inhabited worlds, right. but that didn't they have a sense that, I guess they had no theory of evolution. No, they had no theory of evolution, and I think it was just a much blunter, uh, broader question at that time. They wouldn't focus in on some of the question about origins. Oh. Huh. Yeah, as far as I know. I've never seen it. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Now, have you ever seen a UFO? <laughs> no, I haven't, but... Uh, 
Uh, I get asked that question all the time. Uh -huh. Uh, for, for me, you know, I, I wrote it in one of my books, I wrote a chapter on UFOs. It's a very interesting debate from a lot of different points of view. Uh, and, uh, you know, what it comes down to is the evidence, the nature of evidence. And, uh, you know, you get, um, you, you have a case where 90 some percent, 95 percent or something can be explained. The question is what you do with the other 5 percent. <clears throat> so my point of view is that Maybe that other 5% is something interesting that you should look at. Um, but to say that it's extraterrestrials is sort of jumping mm -hmm. beyond where we really want to. It may be an unknown phenomenon that we don't, or maybe some psychological phenomenon, I don't, I don't know. Uh, but uh, the evidence uh, just isn't there for making the statement that these ha have anything to do with extraterrestrials, I think. So you, your statements sound a little bit more cautious than Hillary Clinton. <laughs> That's right, it would be, yeah. <laughs> so you, I presume you haven't been abducted by any aliens either. No, that's another interesting debate. Um, but you know, the, with regard to UFOs, I think uh, an argument these days is that, you know, virtually everybody has a cell phone with a camera and still all you get are blurry pictures. You don't get <laughs> a, nice, mm -hmm. <laughs> a nice picture of a spaceship that's landed. So um, again, it comes down to the evidence and, uh, you know, with the alien abductions, uh, um, you know, there are people who I think sincerely think that they have been, but you have to ask the question, um, where are all these spaceships that are abducting people, you know, are they invisible or what? So again, evidence. <laughs> now, you know the story of Prester John of, uh, Remind me. okay, there's a, I guess this is the Christian uh, preacher who, uh, I guess went to China or went out in the East or, or to India somewhere. And okay. then, and then, uh, I think several times during the middle ages when there were, Christianity was threatened by Islam. They talked about Prester John. He's going to save us or something. And I guess I, I in my head, I've used that as a uh, the idea that Europeans looking for Prester John in the East is like us looking for ourselves. Instead of we're, it seems to me that we're not. In many cases, we're not looking for aliens. We're looking for ourselves. And if they're not ourselves, then we don't care that much. It's kind of like people who only want to talk to. Only are we would only be not alone if we found intelligent aliens kind of like us, and I'm wondering how prevalent a view that is, because it depends on what we think we are. If we think we're intelligent, then we go looking for intelligence. If we think we're kind and moral people, we'd be looking for kind and moral aliens. If we think we're really great vicious brutes, <laughs> then we'd be looking for that. How prevalent is that a feature of the historical continuity of the question: Are we alone? Well, I mean, before the 20th century, people weren't, again, it was a much broader, blunter question. Uh, they didn't get to, down to that sort of thing. Although, I would say that uh, I think the search for extraterrestrial intelligence is in some ways a search for ourselves for our place in the universe. Uh, because it's a very different universe if we are alone, um, uh, and maybe our destiny is to populate the universe, uh, which is the case in the of course, in the Isaac Asimov Foundation series, there are no aliens in there. It's all humans or robots from humans and that sort of thing, mm -hmm. as opposed to Arthur C. Clarke, where everything, the extraterrestrials are everywhere. Mm -hmm. All of his works almost have, uh, have, have aliens. So um, um, I think that, uh, uh, you know, that's not a question that people explicitly um, address all the time. No, I think they don't. Yeah. But I'm, I was wondering whether we can make it explicit just because it becomes obvious if you study different periods. And well, if you're a Christian, they're looking like Bruno, was he looking for, he was thinking of Christians on these other lands. And if you're, I don't know, if you're a Buddhist, maybe you're thinking of Buddhists living on other countries. Or if you're, I don't know, if you had three legs, you'd be looking for three legged things. Well, I think that's become less and less of the case as we've gone on. I mean, I think. Uh, Scientists like Frank Drake or Joe Totter would be be uh, thrilled if they found something that was totally different from us. <laughs> I asked Frank Drake once about uh, why he thought there were, you know, radio telescopes or intelligent aliens, and he said to read uh, Jerry Jerison. And Jerry Jerison is a paleo neurologist. Do you know his work at I all? Don't, no. Okay, all right. Um, how about the Fermi paradox? Right. All right. Do you have a favorite solution to the Fermi's paradox? Well, I I just think it's a serious argument. Um, you know, against there being extraterrestrials, given the 
given the time scales of the universe. Uh, the Fermi paradox, of course, says that, uh, okay, if there are so many of them out there, why don't we see them, given these millions and billions of years? The, they would have had the time to, to colonize. I mean, you can come up with, as Stephen Webb does in his book, was it 50 or 100 solutions? 50 for the, and then maybe, 75 is yeah, the new one. Okay. <laughs> so maybe they're not interested in interstellar travel. Uh, I don't really uh, have a favorite one unless it's, it's just that uh, a, a solution is something like, you know, they are post-biologicals or something so unlike what we imagine that we just haven't, don't have the right technique. Um, on the other hand, I think that people who say, well, we've been looking for 50 years and we haven't found anything yet, don't realize mm -hmm. that the universe is a huge place. Mm -hmm. And we've looked at a tiny pinprick of, mm -hmm. of that. But earlier in the interview, you said something like, we don't necessarily expect uh, things to evolve towards human-like intelligence. Right. And if that's the case, then we have a solution. That's certainly possible. That's right. But, but that's not your favorite solution. Because um, Frank Drake's favorite solution was N equals L. Like the lifetime, self-destruction. Right, 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 right. 100% right. uh, self-destruction, right. right? Yeah, I don't have a vested interest in this. I try to keep an open mind, and I think, uh, you know, it'd be, I think it would be a more interesting universe in many ways if, if uh, we were not alone, but it's entirely possible that we are. Well, speaking of interest, right. let, can you close your eyes, take a deep breath, and tell me what kind of aliens you'd like to meet? Well... I think one of the big uh, one of the big uh, problems uh, in philosophy is the idea of objective knowledge. How universal is our knowledge? How objective is our knowledge? And if you can meet an, an alien that you can in some way communicate with and see what their knowledge is compared to our knowledge, you will have solved or begun to solve one of the great problems in philosophy. Uh, this goes back to uh, Immanuel Kant and the whole thing about uh, you know how, how universal our, our knowledge is, how our brains you know represent what is really out there or not, um, and uh, I think if you you know got another civilization or, or more and more civilizations and you try and compare your knowledge, uh, you'll see you know how objective our knowledge is, which is a huge question, and I don't see any way to solve it. On the Earth, unless can't we, we just, find can't we just talk to dolphins? <laughs> well, <laughs> they don't uh, have much to say about the universe, do they? <laughs> I don't know. We haven't been able to talk to them, right? <laughs> be, I do think that's a, a good point in terms of uh, a, a starting point for this is more studies about animal intelligence, which people are doing, but the study community hasn't embraced until now. I think mm -hmm. they may start to uh, now because people like Lori Marino. Are, are uh, you know into that kind of idea, and that's certainly a starting point. I think Larry Doyle does a little bit of that too. Yeah. Right? yeah. Do you know? Have you read much of his stuff? Or? Uh, not a lot of his stuff, but I've. Uh, he was at the meeting last month, mm -hmm. and I talked to him for the first time in a long time. Now, currently, there's a there's a there are some in the there's a debate in biology between I guess I envision Simon Conway Morris on one side and then Stephen Jay Gould on the other in which right. it's like deep homology versus convergence. Simon Conway Morris thinks everything's convergent therefore even other planets you have these very steep landscape of selection in which will provide pretty much the same species here as in other planets and then the other one is uh, Stephen Jay Gould is no it's just a it's a crap shoot and it's all kind of crazy and it's all contingent and we can't predict. And so that debate is very important for the astrobiology debate about whether there's life elsewhere. Right. What do you think of that debate? Well, it depends what character you're talking about. You're talking about intelligence or morphology or, or, or what, what else? Well, almost anything because if the idea being, if Simon Cowley Morris says, oh, we found uh, independent evolution of eyeballs, independent evolution of all right. these things. If we find independent, truly independent evolution of a specific aspect of life here, then it becomes a good candidate for what we should expect elsewhere. That's right. the idea. But I guess the deep homologists say that those are not independent. Well, it's one thing to say that eye, eyeballs are convergent, but it, that doesn't mean that intelligence is convergent. So I might slow, fall slightly more in the Stephen Jay Gould. Uh, I mean, you get these arguments. Well, okay, you've got to have a head up here with some eyes so you can look around and <laughs> for your, you know, in an evolutionary sense to stay alive. That's the main thing. Uh, and you've got to have hands to manipulate and that sort of thing. But pretty pretty soon, it's kind of like a just-so story. You know, it's uh, things have to be that way, which 
I think in some ways is what uh, uh, the Warden Brownlee book, uh, Rare Earths, is. Everything has to be just right, uh, which was, which was A.R. Wallace's argument back in uh, 1905, where he came to the conclusion that we were at the center of the universe, you know. So in some ways, I don't think that's a very good uh, set of arguments, a very good way to, to go down. Uh, so, so I would be open to, to anything out there, probably within certain constraints, but the question is, what are those constraints? So can you be a little bit more specific about Wallace's misconception about being in the center of the universe? How did that work in his 1905 book? Yeah, he said, okay, this was Wallace, 1905, Man's Place in the Universe. And he, you know, was a naturalist, a biologist, uh, the co-founder with Darwin of natural selection. So he knew about life. Um, and uh, he looked at this question uh, on whether or not there was life out there uh, from the point of view of the constraints on life and, and that sort of thing. But he went one by one, for example, you know, you couldn't have, um, you couldn't have life around double stars because the temperatures would be, you know, too erratic and that sort of thing. And d down, you know, life has to function within certain temperatures and that sort of thing, uh, which were, of course, much more constrained back then than they are now with what we know about extremophiles. But anyway, he uh, came to the idea that... Uh, uh, from astronomical observations, it looked like we were pretty much at the center of the universe and that was the only place where these conditions for life could be fulfilled. Life or human life? Life in general. I, I thought he kind of agreed with Darwin on everything except whether the human brain was a product of natural Well, that's life. true. Yeah, the brain, that's a different question though, whether the uh, human brain could be uh, a product of, of uh, evolution. Uh, Darwin said yes and Wallace said no. What did Wallace think it was a product of? Uh, I think that's where he brought in theology. And, 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 and the, well, then when he had thought about life on other, around other stars, he right. knew about other stars, right. and presumably he could imagine there are other planets. Right. Did he put only natural evolving things and not theological created brains into these other organisms? Or? Well, mm -hmm. I'm trying to remember the details of yeah. his argument. I, that's been a long time since yeah. I've yeah. read that. But he certainly came to the conclusion that there were no... There was no uh, intelligent life out there. So we were alone. He, that was his... Oh, yes. His, he thought, we are, we us, we are alone. That was his conclusion, right. That we are alone. And when he said the word we, meant we human-like we human intelligent creatures. Right. And, but how about the other question? Are we, the life forms on Earth, alone? Did... I think he, he as I recall, uh, thought that even that was not possible, given the oh. conditions uh, out there. How about Darwin? Did he ever write anything about this? I don't think so, not okay. that I know of. Okay. Yeah. Newton? Newton did, uh, just a little bit in passing. Uh, and Newton with Newton, well, that's, that's, remember I was talking about the cosmological worldviews, uh -huh. that's the one I end with. You had the atomist, the ancient atomist, you had the uh, medieval, uh, Arist the Aristotelian, uh, you had the Copernican, uh, where we had that switch in what you meant to be a worldview, you had the Cartesian, and then you have the Newtonian. And uh, Newton, um, uh, you know, brought in this idea of natural theology. Newton was um, was uh, criticized for saying that, well, if gravitation, universal gravitation works, mm -hmm. you know, and, and, and everything that follows from that, there's no need for God. And so uh, he said from the point of view of natural theology that God would have created uh, other inhabitants around all these worlds to, as, a, as, a, as a, it's a sign of his magnificence and omnipotence and that sort of thing. So that was a whole a beginning of a whole natural theology tradition. Oh, yeah. what about Einstein? Did he ever address this question? Einstein. I don't remember. How about any other scientists that are pretty renowned? I mean, the last two hundred years or so. Did Marie Curie ever think about "Are we alone"? Not that I know of. No. Mm -hmm. uh, well, up through the up through the the nineteenth century, that's Michael Crow's book. A lot of people uh, addressed it. I did the, the book on the biological universe in the 20th century, but that has more to do with, um, you know, the, the modern debate, modern now in terms of, uh, in terms of um, what are the planets like, uh, in other words, planetary science, and eventually planetary system science. This is what I see as the, uh, the, the major disciplines funneling into astrobiology. Planetary science, planetary system science, origins of life, and SETI. 
that's what I've always, in fact, I have a slide where I show those are the things and all the components of those uh, uh, comprising astrobiology. I'm now adding, uh, in the talk I gave recently, uh, social sciences and philosophy, that they should feed into this too because they can give us these other points of view about cognitive science and lots of other things. Let's get back to this metaphysical idea. It seems, to what extent is what we are looking for elsewhere, uh, does that, pro we're projecting ourselves of what we think we are. I would have thought if you think you're good, then you're looking for something good. If you think you're bad, then you're looking for something bad. If you think you're Christian, you're, you're looking for other Christians. If you think you're the smartest thing in the world, you're looking for the smartest thing in the universe. That's projecting yourself onto the universe. Right. So tell me a little bit about the history of people projecting themselves onto the universe. Right. Well, this is a field which I term in the book that I have coming out, astroethics. Um, and I think uh, that we certainly should not do that. We can't, we can't project our own selves, but can we which is a mix of good and bad, of can course. Can we help doing that? Can you, can, how do you prevent yourself from doing that? Well, uh, seems okay, to be let me take one facet of it, altruism. Mm -hmm. uh, altruism, which is non-selfishness. Uh, the, the question is, is there altruism in the universe? Uh, you know, is it, is it nice, altruistic, friendly, cuddly E.T., or is it aliens from the mm -hmm. Alien series? Mm -hmm. um, so the question is, uh, you know, why did altruism evolve on Earth? And uh, some people answer that, the, the, you know, altruism evolved on Earth because as an, it was evolutionarily good, otherwise it wouldn't have happened. Mm -hmm. So you might argue from that that there is altruism out there, but even with our altruism, we still have a lot of bad things. So, I mean, in the end, it seems like a cop-out, but it's probably going to be a mix of good and bad. I don't think you can assume that, uh, again, this idea of progress, that, that they're going to be the perfect, you know, perfectly moral good, good guys. Uh, in fact, that's one of the, that's one of the uh, problems with uh, METI, the messaging extraterrestrial mm -hmm. intelligence, uh, that you, you don't know whether they're going to be good or bad, and some people think we shouldn't. Uh, not just do SETI, but METI, where you're actually yeah. sending out a message and revealing right. our position. Well, Stephen Hawking said we should keep our head down. What do yes, you think of that? I don't agree. You don't agree? Why not? <laughs> totally not agree. Well, for, <laughs> he might say curiosity killed the cat, but I'm saying we can't stifle our curiosity. Well, he's, he didn't say don't uh, listen. He said don't, don't broadcast, listen. right? Right. Now, that curiosity is listening, well, but broadcasting is slightly beyond curiosity. That's right. But, uh, you know, it's, it's, an, it's another way of doing it. And I think, um, you know, we've... Uh, if the, well, first of all, there have been dozens of messages sent already. Mm -hmm. The first one by Frank Drake back in 1974. Some of them stronger, some of them weaker... Uh, so those messages are going out anyway. Aside from all our leakage radiation and, and um, you know, beacon be military radars and things, which are stronger than any message we send no. out. <clears throat> so I think the idea that we're going to reveal our position is not a good argument. Uh, there's a three volumes on the uh, by the Chinese science fiction writer Xi Shen Lu on the three body problem, mm -hmm. which comes to that conclusion that there, you know, there there is a a many message sent out and and uh, you know, sure enough, here come the invaders <laughs> following. <laughs> Is that right? But, you know, that's one, that's one science fiction Does story. I can write another one just the opposite, of course. <laughs> did those invaders try to kill people or something? Or? Yeah, they did. The Trisolarian fleet. Oh, came in and killed <laughs> Tried to take over the Earth, yeah. Wow. Yeah. Okay. So uh, that's a big debate. And there are people, I mean, they're very vociferous, heated debates on METI uh, by people like David Brin, who's a science fiction writer, uh, who, who, uh, has this argument that uh, we really shouldn't reveal ourselves. Uh, but I, I think, you know, the question, uh, I think everybody agrees that there should be some kind of consensus uh, before you do that. But uh, the question is, where do you get that consensus from? Uh, they would say, well, you have to go to the United Nations. Well, the United Nations is not going to take up this problem. They got enough problems, right? <laughs> so then you say, well, it should be from the practitioners. And you might use as an analogy something like the Asilomar Conference, uh, which was a biotech conference back in the 70s, uh, where they put, decided to put restrictions on some biotechnology experiments because they were afraid of what, you know, when you'd have recombinant DNA, what might be released into the environment. Uh, but even the, the four Nobel Prize uh, winners who organized that say that that almost didn't work and wouldn't work now mm -hmm. and was a, probably a bad idea. <laughs> All right. And, 
Yeah. You, you've seen the movie Contact. Oh, yes, many times. Now, at the at the end, the, the little kid asks Jodie Foster's character, are we alone? And she says, well, if we are, it's an awful waste of space. Mm -hmm. What do you think of that? Oh, I don't think that's a very good argument. It could be that presupposes that somebody thinks it's a waste of space. I mean, <laughs> well, some people could, do. <laughs> but... Matter of fact, a lot of people empathize. They think that's a, oh, quite clever and insightful. Yeah, that, that, that argument goes way back in history. I think maybe even... Uh, Maybe even Kepler said that about the moons of Jupiter or something like that, that that would be a waste. Why would they be created if if they weren't inhabited? But by inhabited obviously, by people, I by guess. By people, Okay, yes. so right. if they're inhabited by fungi, then it would still be a waste of space or something. Maybe to Kepler, not to me. I mean, I, right. maybe, maybe you need the whole universe to get us, you know. I'm totally open on that. It's totally possible. All I'm, all I'm saying, what other people, SETI people are saying, and many people, is that we ought to find out. Well, also in the movie Contact, uh, there's the military people, when uh, Jody Foster starts to rec get this message, right. they say, don't look at it, don't look at it. They're, they're instructions to build a machine and then kill us. Right. Now, what, that's a little bit parent. Many people think that's paranoid. Other people agree with that. What do you think? Um, that if we got a message, we shouldn't do anything with it. Yeah. <laughs> I think that's not human nature. We will, we will do something with it. And, uh, and I think, well, you know, we can talk a little bit about the impact of, you know, if you get a signal or that mm -hmm. sort of thing. <clears throat> Some people say that, uh, well, it, it's almost nonsensical to ask the question, what is the impact of finding life beyond Earth, unless you specify the scenario. There are so many different scenarios. Are you talking about finding microbes on the Earth or off the Earth? Are you talking about finding intelligence on the Earth or off the Earth? So you have to specify that. And I always like to point to 1996 and the discovery of the Mars rock, you know, ALH-84001, and the reaction to that. I mean, the media went crazy, and this was in the days before social media, mm -hmm. you know. So in the short term, I think there'll be, there'll be a huge reaction. Uh, the other thing I like to point out is that it's not going to be uh, kind of a eureka moment. You get a, you get a signal mm -hmm. and you decipher it and you have to decide what to do. It's going to be... All discovery, which is what I point out in my book on discovery and classification of astronomy, all discovery is extended, no matter what it is. Mm -hmm. it's, not, it's not a eureka moment. And uh, you can see even the same thing with the Mars rock, where they made these claims. And, you know, there were years and years of claims and counterclaims. It wasn't you got the thing right here in your hand. So you can imagine if you get a signal, you know, uh, there'll be... There'll be questions and arguments about whether it's really artificial or not, and, right, right, right. and that sort of thing. So, uh, when you talk about impact, it's a very uh, complex problem. If I gave you a hundred billion dollars with a caveat, you had to spend it to try to answer the question: Are we alone? How would you spend it? <laughs> you mean like Yuri Milner and the breakthrough? <laughs> like but you're, you have a hundred billion rather than a hundred million. That's a thousand times. That's more. right. His is a hundred million. That's mm -hmm. right. Uh, well, I guess to broaden, to, to start to do what the SETI Institute is doing, which is to broaden the idea of intelligence and think about different techniques. I mean, radio astronomy may be one technique, neutrino astronomy might be another one, or, well, you know, the whole spectrum. Uh, but to th and think about what the implications might be if the universe is post-biological, to bring people in from the artificial intelligence community, uh, to bring people in from cognitive science and uh, philosophy of mind and all these other things, which has kind of reframe the whole question. And you don't need a hundred million dollars for that. A million might do, but, uh, but if you figure out some techniques, some new techniques, that might uh, take a lot more money. How about would you invest in microscopes to look for nano alien spacecraft in this room? <laughs> That's thinking out of the box, all right, but uh, uh, probably, probably not, unless I had some indication that, uh, you know, that that was a fruitful way to go. Uh, you do have to put some constraints on it, I think, when you do when you do think out of the box. Well, do you think we're living inside of an alien right now? No. I mean, this gets to the whole matrix question. Mm -hmm. uh, possible, I guess, but it doesn't seem very likely. And the question is, how would you how would you uh, empirically determine that? You look for a glitch, or maybe the Heisenberg uncertainty principles mm -hmm. are the time resolution of the mm -hmm. simulation. Mm -hmm. Well, you can look. Uh, probably in pursuing that kind of a problem, you would solve some other problems. So it might be interesting <laughs> research direction to go in. But uh, 
Yeah, you're probably not going to get that kind of money from the National Science Foundation <laughs> no, no. <laughs> for that project. <laughs> no. All right. And uh, how about the definition of life? Do you think that's, I mean, if you're trying to answer the question, are we alone, presumably you're looking for life. But if you don't know what life is, what are you looking for? Doesn't that undermine right. the whole thing? Well, I'm kind of in the camp of Carol Cleum, the philosopher, who, and, and Chris Chiba, who say that it's kind of a waste of time, which people have trying to do for the last century, to define life, unless you have to have an operational definition, as the Vikings, Viking spacecraft did. Um, um, people keep trying to do it, but uh, I, I don't... At some point, it's, I don't think it's a very productive thing to do. What's the, but when you're doing SETI, you have to have an operational definition of what is an artificial signal versus what is a natural one. Right. So there you're pretty much the same issue. And do they have a, I would imagine that would be very difficult. Yeah, I mean, that goes to the question of, uh, yeah, how do you determine the artificiality? And, yeah. and I mean, it, usually that's done in terms of a narrow, very narrow band, right? Uh, which you get, you know, you get masers, which are pretty narrow, but p not as narrow as a, as an artificial s signal would be. I'm not an expert in that area, but mm -hmm. yeah, you have to, you have to have uh, criteria which you can specify if you're doing a pr particular thing or a particular research project. But an overall definition of life, spending a lot of time on that, I think, is not a very fruitful thing. How about the future of this question? In let's say ten years, a hundred years, a thousand years, a million years, how? Where do you think this question will go? Right. Yeah, that's one of the criticisms of, uh, of SETI, certainly, that uh, when do you stop? Is, isn't 50 years enough? You've looked for 50 years and you haven't found anything. In some ways, it's the biggest research problem ever because if you don't find within 10 light years, you go out to 50 light years and then, okay, maybe they're further than that. So it's a question, I think, uh, that is always going to be of interest to, to human beings. And it comes down to resources, really. Uh, which SETI doesn't have a lot of, but, uh, but, but, but I think that, it'll continue as long as there are resources. But that, what you just described, right. kind of uh, assumes that an advanced civilization will not colonize and it will stay on its one particular star. Mm -hmm. That seems like a terrible assumption. I well, mean, even if, I don't necessarily believe in advanced intelligence, but right. if I did, right. I surely would not make the assumption that it would stick around it on its star and not explore other stars. Well, why not? Maybe exploration is not an imperative for other kinds of intelligence. It would have to be 100%, right? That's right. That's <laughs> another thing about the Fermi paradox. Yes. If only 1% of them yeah, the, or, explore, or then... Point oh oh yeah, that's right. 1%, right? <laughs> that's why I think the Fermi paradox is a serious argument, you know? mm -hmm. But not definitive enough to say that we should never look. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, I'm not. I, I think we should look, but I don't share the motivation that this that seems to be prevalent. That mm -hmm. life once life gets started turns into starts making radio telescope. Right. So, what do you think is? You've talked to the public about this issue. What do you think of the public and students' biggest misconceptions around the question: Are we alone? I'm asking this because I, we're, we're dealing with students and we say, okay, here's your biggest misconception. You know, what do you think they are? Right. Well, uh, when you, I, think, I think most people, when you ask the question, at least in the audiences I've spoken to, you know, if you ask them to hold up their hands, uh, do you believe in life out there, they'll, they'll say yes. Uh, but they don't have a very good reason for it. I mean, there's the sort of general, very philosophical reason that, you know, you look up all those stars, how could we be alone? Right. Um, so maybe the misconception there is that that's not a very good argument, <laughs> that you need to do more than that, which is to, uh, is to do some scientific research and actually look for whether it's microbial life or other life, and that's what astrobiology and SETI do. Um, uh, other misconceptions might be, you know, that they would be a lot like us, and I think that's not, not likely that they would be humanoid. They could be very different. They could be post-biological rather than biological. And when you say post-biological, what do you mean? Artificial intelligence. And ex and that's a, the, the weakness of that argument is that it's a projection of where we are now. Mm -hmm. uh, and maybe projecting where we are now is not a very good argument. Uh -huh. But uh, I would say that uh, the, um, the weakness of that argument is probably not crazy enough because we, we don't know what's ahead. But it's hard to project what's ahead uh, well, and, and how think, to find it. Do you think the dark matter has anything to do with aliens? 
I don't see why. Dark energy. You can come up with some theory of why, but. <laughs> well, one reason would be if you get smart. I mean, we move from biological to artificial, you know, silicon. You get from silicon, you maybe you can go to vacuum fluctuations as mm -hmm. the substrate that you use to manipulate right. or engender right. your, your consciousness. Well, again, the question is how would you determine that? I guess you investigate the vacuum. I don't know. <laughs> So do you have any advice for students who are thinking about becoming uh, astrobiologists? Oh, advice. Gosh, yes. Well, I think it's one of the most exciting things in science. Uh, it's one of the biggest undetermined questions in science. And uh, uh, I think of astrobiology in a very broad way. It's not just the natural sciences where you need, you, normally you would say, well, you need a very broad background in, <laughs> in biology and astronomy and, and all those things. but. Also, uh, the social sciences, humanities, and, the, and philosophy can contribute to this question with these perspectives from cognitive science and philosophy of mind and, and, and all of these other things. Uh, so if you want to be an, an astrobiologist, it doesn't necessarily mean that you have to, to study natural science. You could also study these other things, um, uh, which I think would give you a broader perspective as I say, I think that's one of the great things about astrobiology. You start asking these questions in an extraterrestrial context. It gives you a broader perspective on any question about is our knowledge universal or you know, is our philosophy objective uh, and, and that sort of thing. So to have a sort of an extraterrestrial perspective, I think, is, is a good thing. And that's what you have to do in general to be an astrobiologist. <laughs> Christian de Duve thought yes. that uh, life was a cosmic imperative. Right. And... Uh, but if life is a cosmic imperative, why are people who are trying to create life in the laboratory not, haven't done so yet? Well, creating life in the laboratory is a little bit of a different thing. Uh, that's, uh, maybe they're not using the right techniques or... Uh, uh, and I'm not sure. I've, I've, I've met Krishna Duve at one of the Templin meetings. Uh, uh, and of course, his, his idea of, a, of a, an imperative for life is the exact opposite of some people like Jacques Monod, who said it's all about chance and necessity and, and, that, and that sort of thing, that famous book that he wrote. Uh, but uh, 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 I don't think there's necessarily a life imperative, even though my working assumption, as I said at the beginning, my presuppositions are that uh, why should we be anything special and, and, and where life can develop, it would develop. Uh, but I don't know that those presuppositions are true, which is why we search. <laughs> well, might, I mean, might life be as quirky as the English language? And you wouldn't expect English-speaking aliens, so maybe you wouldn't expect life elsewhere. Oh, sir. I'm open to that. Entirely possible. <laughs> okay. okay. And uh, are we alone in the universe? <laughs> On my working metaphysical presuppositions, I think we're not. Uh, but it may take a long time to uh, determine that. What are those working metaphysical presuppositions? The presuppositions are the Copernican presupposition that we're nothing special in the universe and the Darwinian presupposition that where life would develop, uh, uh, can develop, it would develop. Um, those are, I mean, uh, I think history so far has shown that we're nothing special in the universe in terms of, you know, 30 years ago, uh, people would argue that, well, how can you believe in life because there aren't even any other planets known beyond our solar system. And then we found planets. And so then they said, well, okay, those are gas giants. Those, are, <laughs> you know, when you go down the whole thing, those are gas giants, you can't have life on there. Okay, then they find Earth-sized ones at least. And they say, well, they may be Earth-sized, but they're not Earth-like. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, so, you know, there's a kind of a history here. We're, going, we're marching down that way and you can't, Again, you can't assume what you want to prove. You can't assume because of all that, that life, maybe that's where the break comes, that life doesn't develop. But uh, there certainly is a, a history of uh, Earth not being anything special, both in a, you know, certainly in a, in a physical kind of a way. And the question is, are we anything special in a biological kind of way? How about uh, one solution to the Fermi paradox called uh, we're the first? Now, when I hear that, I say, well, wait a minute, aren't you just assuming that we're, we're trying to figure out whether we're alone, and then you just assume we are, and then you say that's, what, that's the answer. What do, you, do you have a, an idea or have an opinion about people who want to solve this Fermi paradox with we're first? It doesn't ring true to me because, um, you know, life developed on Earth after the, what's called the late heavy bombardment, you know, within a 
few hundred million years. And so if you had planets uh, in habitable zones 10 billion years ago, I don't see why we should have been first. That's uh, kind of an exceptional, an argument that we're special and exceptional, which is against my presuppositions. <laughs> mm -hmm. but Again, they, maybe my presuppositions aren't right, but <laughs> at least I put them out there. <laughs> well, how are we going to make progress on this issue, answer this issue? Well, I think we need to broaden our ideas about techniques. Uh, astrobiology is doing that and has done that. Uh, astrobiology 20 years ago with the astrobiology roadmaps you know, greatly expanded from just a little what exobiology had been before with the origins of life studies, putting it in a in a context uh, uh, in the context of where life might develop and and uh, a lot of other things. And I think SETI needs to do the whole do the same thing. And they're just now beginning to do that. They're 20 years behind the astrobiology roadmaps.